Bienvenidos a todos. Muy bien. Welcome to the Gender Institute. I'm Carrie Toronto Brayman. I'm a professor in the English department. I'm a, the director of the Gender Institute. And welcome. I'm thrilled to see so many of you here today. Uh, we have a terrific lineup of speakers this semester. Here is the lunchtime series, and I'll circulate it. And uh, Professor Eric Seaman from History will be talking about his new book. Uh, Professor Kathleen Parks, who's here, will be talking about her research that she's doing about um, sexual assaults on campus. We cover a whole range of topics at the Institute, and we just showcase the wonderful research that our scholars are doing. One other thing, too, this is the Centennial 2020 of uh, Women's Right to Vote, the 19th Amendment, and we are having a big symposium here on North Campus on March 6th. Some nationally renowned scholars, historians, English professors will be here talking about their research, about the impact of that, and the legacy with Shirley Chisholm, and who's, bu who's buried here in Buffalo. We're going to have her biographer here talking about her legacy for all of us. So here's uh, an announcement about that. I'll circulate that for March 6th. And there's free lunch at the Center for the Arts, the lobby. It'll be gorgeous. The morning sessions will be in the Center for the Arts, and the afternoon will be in Barrett Hall. One other thing, uh, we're in honor of the 19th Amendment, we are having voter registration. Uh, the deadline to register to vote in the New York primary is Friday, Valentine's Day. Does anyone know when the New York primary is? It's Tuesday. Okay, when? April 28th. Yay, April 28th. And you, if you're not registered in Buffalo or at UB, if you're registered downstate, you will need to get an absentee ballot or change your address 20 days before, so by April 1st. You can use this form to change your address. And I was a ballot observer in 2016 and I saw in the student union, and I saw so many students turned away because they were registered in Brooklyn or Queens and not here, and they hadn't applied for uh, an absentee ballot. So if you're going to be here, it might be easier just to fill that out. I will personally mail them all today. All right. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Sharona Frederick, who teaches in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures. She's a specialist of the early modern era in the New World, and the range and depth of her knowledge from Mayan cosmologies to the Judeo-Spanish diaspora is truly impressive. Dr. Frederick received a Gender Institute research grant last year that funded her travels to archives in South America and Spain. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about her new project on female pirates in the early modern new world. So thank welcome, Dr. Much. Frederick. Thank you. And thank you very much to everybody who's come, and especially to my students <laughs> and the Stigwitz College. <laughs> thank you very much. That's Professor Paolo Golini. So if any of you have not yet taken a class in Italian, that's who you take it with. Okay, before we actually start the talk, what we're going to have is a little bit of a visual introduction to the idea of female pirates. So first I'm going to thank Hillary, who also works here at the Gender Institute, for um, helping me put this wonderful thing together. You're wonderful, Hillary. Let's start... Um, well, we're on her. <laughs> Shall we start with her? Can you let, let's yeah. start with that first one? <clears throat> so you guys can get you guys, you folks, you people, sex and swords and petticoats, female piracy, early modern new world. We're talking about the centuries. We often talk about 16th, 17th, 18th century. Anne Bonny from Ireland. Mary Reed from England. Whoop, and the guy on the end there was Calico Jack. This is an image, okay, yeah, let's hold that for one second. So, if any of you are slightly familiar with the Pirates of the Caribbean films, Captain Jack was based on, Captain Jack, well, that's another image of Van Bonnie. And slideshow, just do Yeah. Can we just get it back? And just hold it on them. Hold it on them. Yes, so Captain Jack was based on Calico Jack, who was a real person. Why do we remember the band more than we remember the women? He was married to Anne Bonny, who was the fiercest pirate 
of the early 18th century. She was called, she was called, the terror of the Caribbean, and he was known as her husband. <laughs> okay? So we have to kind of uh, change the paradigm in which we usually know the woman as somebody's wife. Anne Bonny <clears throat> and Mary Reed, who was an English woman with whom she became friends, who was also a pirate, represented this very, very strong idea of womanhood, which was extremely different to where most women in the Western world or also in Asia, because we're, go we're going to get to the Pacific in this class, as well in this class, you can tell I'm still back in my classroom, sorry, in this lecture in this class, uh, as well, this was not a role women were allowed to take. So these women did not ask for permission. The first thing I want you to understand very clearly is that we are talking about women outside the law. If you're a pirate, you're outside the law. Why did women become pirates? Why didn't you just marry the nice boy your parents wanted you to marry? Well, in this case, she did marry the nice boy she wanted to marry. He wasn't exactly the choice her parents chose for her. Um, folks, I will, I will answer that question by defining a female pirate in comparison to another female trope model idea from that time, which is the witch. The witch was also outside the law. If a woman was accused of witchcraft, as many of you know, and actually brought to trial, she had no hope. Her only possibility was choosing the way she died. Okay? She was guilty once accused. Witches represented the women accused of witchcraft, represented the most disempowered part of the female population. Female pirates represented the most empowered parts of the, pop, uh, of the female population because both witches and pirates, for women, are outside the law. Male pirates are also outside the law. So if you're outside the law, you're not really going to care what the law tells you to do. And so in piracy, <clears throat> and we'll define piracy in one second, in piracy, you have a tremendous amount of people joining this kind of underworld because in quote-unquote legal society there is very little place for them or just a bad place for them. So who are you going to find being very, very prevalent in piracy? Black people. Okay, first of all, any slave who ran away knew that as long as they stayed in legal society in the New World, colonial society, whether it was dominated by the British or the Spanish, and the British and the Spanish and the French are going to be the main players here, the slave would have to be returned to their former master. Only in pirate society would the slave not be returned. So you can understand why many people of African descent joined the pirates, correct? But now we have to understand why women joined the pirates. Since women were completely disempowered under the law, you were your husband's property, or you were your father's property, or you were the property of the next male relative in line to you, there were very few ways you could manage to be, quote unquote, free. Now, we have to define piracy, and I think we have to begin at the beginning, because piracy is quite Violent. What was piracy? Let's start by descri describing what it was not. Piracy was not when you attacked the ship of an enemy nation under the name of another nation. So, for example, when Queen Elizabeth Tudor sent her English privateers to attack King Philip II of Spain's ships, that was not piracy, that was privateering. Because those men were fighting for England. Piracy was when you didn't fight for a country. Piracy was considered the brotherhood and the sisterhood, because by the way, it was the only society, kind of large international society, in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, where a woman was viewed as a man's equal, and where a woman had the same rights as a man. 
there. That did not exist in any legal code in the New World or the Old World. It existed in the pirate codes. So why would a woman go into piracy? Why would a woman join the society that had allegiance, had loyalty to no state? Why would they join a society where the minute they were caught, they would be hanged? Now what happened to these two women, we're not quite sure of. We know that Anne Bonny and Mary Reed were caught. We know that they were brought to trial together with Calico Jack. He was ha whoop, well that whoop, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, that's an image of them from the time, from the early 18th century. You see them dressing in pants, okay, which was also considered the equivalent of witchcraft. <laughs> because a woman imitating a man's dress was considered sorcery. Since when they were caught, <clears throat> they were scheduled to be hanged, and then they both disappear. It's a rather weird story. We can assume they either escaped, or, because there is no record of their hanging, that they somehow fought their way out of prison. Now... Why would you choose to join one of these two pirate societies? There were two pirate societies that lasted for close to 300 years. And folks, they had standards of admission. I don't know if they were equivalent to UBs, but <laughs> you couldn't just get in. You couldn't just get in. You had to swear loyalty, first of all, to no country, but only to the captain of the ship on which you served. And that was true whether the captain of your ship was male or female. Now I repeat this, there was no other place in society where a woman could have that leadership role unless she was born into royalty. Most women and most men were not born into royalty. So many men who were of very, very, very poor backgrounds also joined the pirates. Why? There was no upward economic mobility. And frankly, if you served in the king's navy, whether it was the English king or queen or the Spanish king, what you would earn would be far less than what you would earn if you were a pirate and attacked a ship, and then everybody basically divided up the booty. That's why so many people became pirates. Reason one, if you were marginalized, it often provided the only society in which you could have any rights at all. Reason two, if you were a woman, it was literally the only type of society where you had equality, where a man, if he was on your crew, had to call you captain, if that's what you were. And reason three, because piracy ends up providing a kind of refuge, and I'm quoting a very important historian by the name of Marcus Redeker, who is an authority on piracy and marginalization, Marcus Redeker tells us, and he presents very convincing proof, that if you were not rich, and if you were not part of the ruling class, in nine out of 10 cases, piracy offered you the only economic mobility that you could have. That's why so many people went into it. What were the two pirate societies? One in the Caribbean, one in the Pacific. The one in the Caribbean you may have heard of just even through novels and films. It's called the Pirates of the Spanish Main. And that was a loose organization that had a code of conduct. And in that code of conduct, women were respected. Now this is awfully interesting because if you compare the code of conduct of the Pirates of the Spanish Main to the naval codes of conduct of either England or Spain, in those codes of conduct, it was considered bad luck for a woman to be on board a ship. Okay, so now look at this huge contrast between the way a woman is viewed in illegal, marginalized pirate society and the way she's views, viewed in legitimate society. Okay, that's an important point. The second pirate society was in the Pacific. 
and it was actually based on the coast of Chile, and it was called the Brotherhood of the, <coughs> of the Black Flag, and it was actually called that in Spanish. Pirates of the Spanish Main was called that in English because it was founded by English and Irish pirates. On the Pacific coast, it was actually founded by a bunch of Spanish-speaking pirates who were outlaws from Spain, and that was La Hermandad de la Bandera Negra, okay, the Brotherhood of the Black Flag. Let's talk about Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed, because their story, I think, represents a little bit um, of why the lore, the attraction to piracy, would be so strong for women who were otherwise trapped. So, can you flip it one more? Okay, so this is an insanely romanticized image of Anne Bonny. Um, like crazy romanticized. We have no idea what she looked like physically because there are, there are no paintings of her. But she was rumored to be very beautiful. She was an Irish woman from the county of Connaught in, in Connaught, sorry, in West Ireland. Her family moved to the New World when she was about five. So she grew up actually in the Carolinas, okay, here in what is now the United States. And she was destined to be married to somebody exceedingly boring. And she was also destined to inherit a whole bunch of slaves. But Anne Bonny apparently was too friendly with the slaves, and she did not want to marry, although she was forced to marry him. That was her first husband, this very boring person that her father had picked out for her. So eventually Anne Bonny falls in with a group of outlaws. Outlaws who are essentially friendly to escaped slaves, and some of whom are, are female. So she is not the first female pirate. She may very well be the most famous one in the New World, She's not the first. And folks, if we're looking for the first female pirate of the New World, we also have to go back to Ireland, although I can't talk about her a lot because we're focusing on the New World. The first one in the 16th century is named Grace O'Malley. And she was also from Connaught in West Ireland. So I don't know what's going on in County <laughs> Connaught. But you gotta go there and strong women. Okay, she runs away. She, she was legally still married to her first husband. She runs away. She has to escape British territory, because remember the Carolinas were British territory. She can't go to Spanish territory, which is the rest of the Americas, because that's also not going to be very friendly to her. So what she does is she sails away alone to Nassau, okay? So this is also a woman getting on a ship by herself. Actually, folks, what we're finding out is that there were many, many more women getting on ships than, than are famous, because they're written about, but history tended to focus only on the guys. So now we're also learning about the women. <clears throat> she arrives in the Bahamas, and the Bahamas have been completely taken over by pirates. So although the Bahamas are officially British territory, essentially they're run by outlaws people who are running from the law for many reasons. What could be the reasons? Religious persecution. So you have Irish Catholics running from Protestant England. You have Spanish Jews and Spanish Muslims running from Catholic Spain. You have Catholic and Protestant Frenchmen running from each other, but meeting there over a good beer, because yes, they drank a lot. That's not just in the movies. You have a lot, a lot, a lot of escaped African slaves. You have a lot of Native Americans who escaped there. You have a lot of Native American pirates. And Anne Bonny, as she's viewed in this over-romanticized modern image, quickly becomes one of the most feared of the pirates. And she well, she commandeers a ship. I don't want to say she rents a ship. Pirates don't rent. You want it, you go and you take it. She commandeers a ship, which is a very um, highfalutin way to say she kidnaps a ship. She does not kill the crew. Now, this is also something rather weird that we have to start seeing. The pirates, to a certain degree, were much less violent than you think because overwhelmingly, and Carrie, this has to do a lot with the research I was doing over the summer in Peru, um, 
in most of the accounts of pirates taking over ships, the crew is not killed. So it's a lot less boring than in the movies. It's not always, Psh, here goes the sword. Sometimes they'll take out a sword. Nine out of ten cases, the crew surrenders and turns pirate. Which is also a way of telling you that the living conditions for the crew were so bad that becoming a pirate was much more tempting. All right, Because literally you would make money or you would be more protected than if you served in state service. She commandeers a ship and very quickly she gets a first mate who it turns out is also a woman. So Hillary, my dear, can you please flip to that picture of the statue of the two of them and Bonnie and her first mate, Mary Reed. Okay, now this is, this is a very, very, very um, powerful statue. <coughs> it's on the island of Jamaica, but I have to tell you there are actually copies of the statue all through the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And Bonnie from Ireland, Mary Reed from England, the young man and Bonnie thought that she captured, who turns out to be a young woman dressed up as a man. Why? Because Mary Reed is also running from a charge of witchcraft. Mm. Now, folks, some of you know if you're charged with witch witchcraft, you have no hope. All right? And it's really, really important to understand this, that in 99% of the witchcraft trials, this is something that has been substantiated by anthropologists such as Marvin Harris, such as Gerard Reichel Dolmatov, in 99% of the cases, the woman will die. The only thing she can do is choose how she dies. She can be strangled if she implicates other people, and if she doesn't implicate other people in her confession, she will be burned. So being a pirate is preferable. Well, Mary Reed was another woman. And Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, the two of them, we're talking about what time period are we talking about? 1716 to 1723. That's exactly the, these seven years here. That these two women attacked ships, took a great deal of booty, but what was really bothering both England and Spain was that all of the crews were always surrendering to them and turning pirate. Because frankly, it was a better lifestyle. If you were poor, if you were not in power, this empowered you. These are not my ideas only, people. I am giving you basically the point of view of some very important social historians. And social history, as we know, is a type of history that focuses on regular people, people like us and not only the kings and queens. So I am quoting to you an important social historian by the name of Robert Anthony from the University of Kentucky, and a very, very important Spanish language historian who sadly has never been translated into English, but he has into French. Neil, you can read him. Okay. Uh, okay. Cesar Garcia de Piñera. Cesar Garcia de Piñera. And that was among the most important research, thank you, Gary, that I was able to do to find his writings, which have never been translated into English, which is quite a pity. But as these historians show us, these women, although they were outlaws, although they were considered evil, become incredibly attractive to many people. And I want to point that out to you folks because when you see later images in novels and films of female pirates, they are invariably very beautiful. Whether Anne Bonny and Mary Reed were that beautiful, I don't know. I'm quite sure they had a great deal of charisma and a great deal of sexual attraction that may have had little to do with the way they looked and much more to do with the power that they exuded. So for seven years, they were a type of, as the people of the time viewed it, Robin Hood. And Daniel Defoe, a very important uh, English author, actually Scottish, but British author of the 18th century, says that the people of Jamaica viewed them as a type of Robin Hood, essentially, because they were known to steal from the rich and give to the poor. And so this is one reason, folks, why the popular image of pirates is kind of positive, particularly if you look 
even in contemporary movies or movies that go as far back as Douglas Fairbanks' 1925, The Black Pirate, okay? The image of pirates in films is quite enchanting. One of the reasons is in the popular memory, they are viewed as people who help the poor. Um, uh, now, for women, of course, and for the ruling powers, British, French, or Spanish, women like this had to be exterminated because a woman with a sword represented power and represented a challenge not only to male authority, to any authority. That is not what a woman was supposed to do. They were also considered witches because they were, quote unquote, cross-dressing. Now the first time that term is actually used in English is at their trial. Okay, so that's awfully interesting. I dearly wish I could tell you I found that out. I didn't. That's from the historian Marcus Redeker. If I found that out, I would already be much wealthier than I am. Okay, but it probably was not the first time the term was used, period. I'm sure it was, it was in the language, but that's the first time we can find it in a legal document. In Spanish, because these two women also terrorized Spanish shipping, although of course most of the Spanish sailors also joined them, they were called hembras marimachos. That's interesting. Hembra, hembra is a term for female, but we use that in Spanish when we describe a horse. Okay? We use it for an animal. We don't usually use it for a woman. We don't say, ella es hembra. Ella es mujer. She's a woman. So it's a bit of a rough term. Mari macho, combination of feminine and masculine. But folks, the term which pops up very frequently in Cuba, Colombia, Chile, and Peru is not an insult. It was used to determine and to describe a strong woman. And Spanish authorities also considered these women witches because folks, what, what was called cross-dressing for a woman to wear pants, for a man to wear a skirt, was prohibited by the Spanish Inquisition. Okay? So, these women were quite frightening to all of the authorities. I also want you to know that piracy under the code of the Spanish Inquisition was considered the second worst crime after religious heresy, after professing another religion. So you were talking about a system of control that was very, very strong. Now, one of the most interesting characteristics about Let's stay with Anne Bonny and Mary Reed because we kind of know them and they're people we can understand as people. They were famous for having religious freedom on board their ship. And they did. Anne Bonny was Catholic. Mary Reed was Protestant. Calico Jack was God. He was drunk most of the time. <laughs> and by the way, I have to tell you, the way they were caught, the British Army sent a large ship after them all of the men, sorry guys, but this is not one of your better moments, all of the men, including Captain Calico Jack, were down in the hatch getting drunk. The only three people who fought, there's one man who fought, and I think it's very, very significant, he was an escaped black slave. So he fought with Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. Everybody else was down there getting drunk. Okay? also something interesting, the woman and the one black man fight to the death because they know what's going to happen to them. For them, there's going to be absolutely no mercy. Why was there religious freedom on their ship? Was it because Anne Bonny was a crusader for religious freedom? This is something interesting about piracy. Certain things like gender equality, I will use that word now. Even though Carrie, some people might say that's an anachronism, an anachronism taking things out of its time context. No, I am actually going to call it gender equality because they were speaking in those terms. 
at her trial, Anne Bonny says, I had men under my command, and they had to obey me, and they did so happily. So I think we can use the term gender equality. Why religious equality? Well, because if you have a pirate ship, folks, you do not have time to have a long admissions process. Okay, so it's not like when you applied to UB and you waited. Somebody comes up to you probably with a sword, or maybe if it's a woman with a little sword, and we'll get to this in one second. This is from the Pacific side, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to this. Um, this is actually from Nepal, but I'll tell you how it gets to the Pacific. <laughs> You had to accept whom you had to accept. And so the people who would come to you, again, Irish Catholics running from England, Spanish Jews and Muslims running from Spain, French Huguenots running from France sometimes, French Catholics running from Huguenots, you would get everybody. So the one rule that we know that Anne Bonny made on her ship was that, and this sounds awfully modern, when a person prays, and she said person, not man, the account of her trial is very interesting. It is in Daniel Defoe's Life of Pirates. Okay, in fact, it's one of the most important chapters in that book. That's a book that was published right after their trial in the early 18th century. She says simply, when a person prays, it will be between that person and their creator. That's all. Now, again, I don't think she started out as a crusader for religious freedom, but something happens in piracy which is very interesting, which is because people are thrown together, because they are persecuted and they are outside of the law, or because they have few rights and they prefer to be outside of the law because they will have more rights if they are outlaws, you begin to have a certain type of tolerance developing. We know, for example, in the Pacific, with the Brotherhood of the Black Flag, La Hermandad de la Bandera Negra, we have a lot of Muslims there. Why do we have a lot of Muslim pirates? Because, from their point of view, many of them will be descended from the Moriscos, the Muslims of Spain, who had been kicked out, and they will flee to farther areas of the Spanish Empire. Not Mexico, which is well policed, the Pacific coast, which is kind of crazy. In fact, we know in Spanish documents of the era, if you were a soldier sent from Spain, you begged to be sent to Mexico and not to Peru, <laughs> because you could not police the Peruvian and Chilean coast. Too big, too wild. And so many Spaniards of Muslim background, again, the people who were called the Moriscos, and who had been officially eliminated, i.e. exterminated, in Spain during the time of that king I love to hate, Philip II, um, many of them will find refuge in these far, far, from Europe's point of view, far areas in the Americas, on the Pacific coast. <coughs> that group of pirates on the Pacific coast had a great deal of contact with pirates from China, and the Philippines. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, weren't all the pirates in the Caribbean? No, folks, there were tons of pirates in the Pacific. Because, remember, the Spanish had a ship that came from Manila, from the Philippines. It was called the Manila Galleon, which would come every so often, dock in Peru, then dock in Cartagena, well, not dock. They would literally walk over land, take the wealth that they had gotten in Asia, bring it to Cartagena de Indias in Colombia, and then sail to Spain. But what the pirates of the Pacific would do would be to attack the Spanish galleon before it docks. Many Muslim men joined that fellowship, but so did Muslim women. And so I have a kind of interesting story to tell you about this little sword. This is, supposedly, a little female pirate sword. And it was given to me about 15 years ago when I was doing field work in Yucatan, which is the Atlantic coast. But one of my colleagues was from India, and he knew I was extremely interested in research on uh, outlaws and outlaw women. And he said, Sharona, I'm going to give you this. This 
And folks, it's true. I looked this up. I saw this in museums. This is the type of illegal sword that Muslim and Hindu women would carry with themselves as protection if they would be attacked sexually. So when I mentioned this to Hillary, she had a very good parallel. She said it's the first original pepper spray. <laughs> because it was illegal in either Europe or any country in Asia for a woman to carry arms. Okay, if any of you are familiar with the story of Joan of Arc, one of the reasons that Joan of Arc was burned as a witch by the British was because she dressed as a man and she was armed. And said she could talk to God who wanted her to kill the British. Which definitely did not endear her to the English. <laughs> Granted, no. But I want you to take a look at this tiny little sword. I told Hillary and Carrie I would pass it around, but I'm afraid you might stick somebody with it. <laughs> Actually, I will pass it around. Please keep it in its little holder. It sounds so cool. When <laughs> and you're not going to do that, man. Um, because I do think it, it embodies for you what women had to go through. And still have to go through. And often what men also have to go through. Because piracy was this fellowship that was, quote unquote, open to all. Now, its main century was from the beginning of the 17th century to the end of their trial. So if you're talking about the great age of piracy, you're talking round about from 1620 to 17, let's say 25, after the two of them have been tried and then they disappear or they escape or God knows. Why the 17th century and not the 16th century, when the 16th century was actually the, the century of the conquest of the New World? I think you have to look at the personality of the two personalities, of the two major rulers of the 16th century in the New World, who would be Spain's King Philip II and England's Queen Elizabeth I. Both of those personalities were far too strong to permit the growth of these independent organizations, like the Pirates of the Spanish Main, like the Brotherhood and Sisterhood of the Black Flag, because you were aligned either with England or with Spain. Now, the one exception to that, and it's always the exception, is Ireland. Because there was that earlier female pirate, Grace O'Malley, who did not side with either England or Spain. She often attacked both of them. Okay? She had a personal meeting with Queen Elizabeth I, but she was not beholden to either side. It's in the 17th century, after King Philip II is dead, after Queen Elizabeth Tudor is dead, that you finally begin to have this outgrowth of independent pirate societies which are not beholden to any ruler. And this is where the French come in. I will not leave you out. My French well, delegation yes. from Ireland. <laughs> De Rien, or however you say it. Um, folks, it is in the 17th century that you're going to have a lot of French women running away to the New World, attempting at the beginning literally to be small business women. But they encountered too many obstacles as free women. And so, eventually, in the city of Cartagena, I mentioned that city before, it's a very beautiful city in Colombia, it used to be a real pirate trap, you begin to have a large French population, mainly female, of women who have tried to run their own businesses, but they've been raped or they've been attacked. And they at one point also say the heck with it and join the pirates. Now joining the pirates did not necessarily mean you became a pirate. I mean that's the fun part. That's like the movies. Ooh, I get a sword, I swing, swing on the yard arm. No, what it meant is your business, if that's what it was, would work together with the pirates. It meant that when an escaped black slave came to your business, you would not turn them in. 
Okay, there was a, literally a code of behavior. It meant that you would not think on somebody, you wouldn't tell the Spanish Inquisition, that, that was in Cartagena, or you wouldn't tell the British, who kind of had the Protestant version of the Catholic Inquisition, you wouldn't tell the British that, oh, somebody's Catholic, or you wouldn't tell the Spanish, oh, somebody's Jewish or Protestant or Muslim. You would keep silence. And folks, this is what eventually creates this very positive attitude that most of the common people had toward the pirates. You should not be surprised that so many women, and I would say in particular French women, because Neil, correct me if I'm wrong, I kind of get the impression that in, in France at that point, there was a little bit more liberty for women than in either England or Spain. Am I out of my mind? Well. There is something to be said about that quickly. You had what mm -hmm. was called uh, les filles du roi, who were women sent over to the New World. But what was interesting yeah. with them, they certainly with the intent to populate and found families, but the women had to, the liberty to choose their suitor. And the women, everything was in the woman's name. Oh, and that, that's extraordinary, mm -hmm. because that in England or Spain was absolutely unheard of, and unheard of in British or Spanish territories in the New World. In Montreal was essentially founded by, um, by prostitutes and nuns. Yeah, 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 that's very true, that's very true. So you have these societies developing where I would say, together with the historian Robert Anthony, of course women would be friendly to pirates. Any woman who essentially wanted any degree, I won't use the term equality because it didn't exist. I'll use a term that existed in Spanish and English, in Gaelic, poder, power. Wanted power, it was if you wanted any degree of personal power, you would not find it in a society within the law. But I'm going to end, because I have to end in five minutes, so this will end. I'm going to end on a very curious note that will, I think, illustrate to you that women that you might not associate... Thank you, Bob. <laughs> I'm very pleased that one of my colleagues did not want to stab me. Really. You might not, want, not, might not think of associating a nun who is actually the national saint of Peru with pirates. But, folks, the national saint of Peru is a woman who lived in the early 17th century named Santa Rosa de Lima. So, Saint Rose of Lima. And Santa Rosa de Lima, in Peruvian, in fact, in, in South American history, is extremely important. She was a brilliant woman. Um, there's kind of a history of Latin American nuns who are a bit rebellious. Some of you are more familiar with Sor Juana from Mexico. Mm -hmm. But before Sor Juana, almost a century before, is Santa Rosa de Lima. And Santa Rosa was actually a little bit of an activist for escaped black slaves. And this brings her into a great deal of problems with her mother's superior. But Santa Rosa is acting from what she considered a very Christian point of view. She viewed slavery as immoral. And so guess what? This is actually going to bring her closer to the pirates. And in one of the most interesting episodes of 17th century South American history in general, Peruvian history in particular, when the pirate, he's known in Spanish as Lorencillo, and in English, I don't know what, what you would call him, Little Lawrence, okay? <laughs> Lorenzillo. When he came to attack the city of Lima, Santa Rosa went down to the coast to a particular city, which was known as the Pirate Port, right next to Lima. It's called Callao, C-A-L-L-A-O. And Santa Rosa, she was not yet a saint, she would be beatified within a few years of her death, she made a personal appeal to Lorenzillo, quote unquote, to leave the poor people alone. In other words, you can do what you want to the rich people. <laughs> leave the poor people alone. And treat the women with respect. Folks, 
Lorenzillo did not touch one woman. He did not rape one woman. No poor person was hurt. In fact, he turned his ships around and offered a very personal message to Santa Rosa, thanking her for her intervention and telling her that he would always do her bidding. Now, this is something that will get Santa Rosa into political problems because it seemed like they were a little too close. And I'm not insinuating that they had a romantic relationship. She was a nun and she was a devout nun. But she had no problems dealing directly with a pirate. And he seemed to respect her a great deal. And this is part of Santa Rosa's legend. And think about it, folks, because since she was known as somebody who protected black people when they ran and escaped slavery, she would have had few allies in that, except for another priest who, by the way, was also Afro-Peruano, Afro-Latino, and that's um, Saint Martin, who was a friend of hers. And apart from him, the pirates. I mean, you have to remember, law at that time did not protect, you know, racial equality. There was no racial equality. So Santa Rosa set herself outside the bounds by her, whatever that relationship was with the pirate Lorendi. And finally, in the last minute, I'd like to bring up the fact, can we go back to that funky image of um, Anne Bonnie, Mary Reed, and Calico Jack? Another kind of image of Anne Bonnie. Okay, there, that. Folks, by the way, this is from a website, which is called Deviant Art. And the reason that I wanted to show you this is because I can think of nothing that shows better the impact of the whole pirate legend than its lasting quality into the 21st century. This is from a video game, if any of you are familiar with Assassin's Creed. So the fact that these images continue to exist in the popular imagination, I definitely think relate, and I'm looking at the clock, my final 10 seconds, because I know many of my students will have to go. This does connect the idea of social history to the pirates. Why do we keep on viewing them as something positive? If you're not royalty, they were good to you. And if you're a woman, they might have been the only place where you would have found anything remotely resembling personal power. And that's it. Oh, bravo.